guys. I was on a professional development trip last week, but I am happy to be back. Um, build your bones. I hope you got a lot out of it last week. I'm Marie Eric. I am in Liberty County, and today my co-presenter is Melanie Taylor. Um, she's in Bay County, and just want to remind you all, we are recording. If you want to be anonymous, please um, turn your video off and change your name on your screen. As always, we have the chat box available for any kind of questions or anything else. So with that being said, let me see. I can get my screen to move forward because don't you guys love it when the toolbar lands right where you need to be to move your slides. There we go, here we go. So if you haven't already done so, um, any kind of check-ins, Anybody put anything in the chat box for us, Wendy? Um, something they might have done, a goal from last week? Not yet, but we didn't ask. And that's one thing that um, we didn't follow up with last time. So thank you for bringing that up. So has anyone had any anything they wanted to share regarding their goal setting from last week or the, even the previous week? I know a few of you have emailed me personally and shared some great things. So thank you for that. Um, Wendy, when I moved my people over on the screen, can you see uh, that? No, I cannot. I don't see okay. it. I see your slides. Mm -hmm. Okay. Awesome. All right. So anything in the chat box, anything? Yes. Anybody wants to share? Says, um, started a journal to find out how much calcium is in the meals I'm already eating. Excellent. Thank you, Janetta, for sharing. I like that. Yep. That's a good way to do it. Day journals work. Yep. They do. It gives you a lot of good information. I sure do. Well, I will just go ahead and move on. But if anybody does have anything that they think of they want to share, as always, chat box. Drop it in there. Right. We want to hear from you. Marie, one more right. before we go on. I have to share because it's, um, although this, per a couple of things, um, one started chair exercises, also <laughs> mating a list of things to discuss with my doctor, which is so pertinent and such a good topic for today's theme yes. of screenings and medications. So thank you guys. Feel free to keep putting them in the chat. Yes, absolutely. I am very much one of those people that says, absolutely make a list, take it to your doctor. So that being said, um, osteoporosis is a disease that um, has a lot of misconceptions sometimes. Um, everybody kind of associates it with, you know, older women, especially Caucasian women. But that's not really true. Um, it can occur both in men and women and of any race. So anybody can be at risk for this. Also, just because you drink milk regularly doesn't always mean that you're gonna have wonderful bone health. Um, so that importance of the calcium and the absorption and things like that, you guys discussed some of that last week, but don't worry, we have more. So um, last week was the eating tips for your bones. Um, we're moving on to kind of screening and medication. So we're building on everything here. So we're gonna learn about the methods of testing your bone density, and then also talk about some of the medications and supplements that play a role in your bone health. So that's really what our goals are for today. So why would you want to get screened? Anybody want to throw something in the chat box? Remember that toy that used to have on that next one down the road? Got any comments, Wendy? Not that I see. Okay. Um, kind of like that self-assessment you did is a great starting point. Um, you kind of know where you are. Um, you know, screening is, you know, knowing your risk factors and then, you know, applying proper preventative measures to um, maybe prevent or treat bone loss if you actually are discovered to have it. A bone density study is one 
the, really the only real way to see if you have osteoporosis or if you've had some loss of your bone mass. Um, if you wait until you have a fracture or some other kind of related problem, um, then you know you already have the disease. But checking ahead of time for declining in your bone density can really help you to implement some of those lifestyle changes or preventative measures um, and potentially, you know, get a good treatment plan going. Um, because as you age, you know, sometimes that's just the way it works. We do lose that bone density. Um, this particular scan is a DEXA scan that you see on the screen and they are like the gold standard. And that is a very accurate depiction of what it looks like coming up on the screen. Um, so it's really important to, you know, talk to your doctor and see if this is where you need to go. I didn't know this screen had those pop-ups, sorry, <laughs> but it is the only way to determine osteoporosis and to take those. So who should get screened? Um, there are no absolute universal recommendations for testing. Um, we just did an update and we went through and we looked at the National Institutes for Health and some other places, and they still don't have absolute concrete recommendations, but different medical societies have established different guidelines, um, and it's very much an individualized approach, and that sometimes can be a really good thing because we are all different. But the National Institutes for Health and the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force recommend all women over the age of 65, uh, postmenopausal women who are younger than age 65, because they can be at an increased, increased risk for osteoporosis. Um, there is a lack, <clears throat> excuse me, of evidence for screening for men, but also, if you are a nicotine user, that can be a problem too. So additional screening indicators are um, ophorectomy, which is when you've had your ovaries removed. You may not have had a total hysterectomy, but they might have removed the ovaries for a various reason. Um, and you might or might not be on hormone therapy. And so if you're not on that hormone therapy, then, you know, you do lose some calcium in your bones. Um, it doesn't matter if you're a traditional smoker or if you use um, an e-cigarette device. Nicotine actually decreases the intestinal absorption of calcium. And so that can be a really bad problem. Additionally, some of the toxins in tobacco smoke um, affect the activity of the osteoblast. And remember, the blast builds the uh, blood. So, or the, yeah. They're rebuilding the bone, the class to break it down. So it, it affects the osteoblast and the osteoclast. And those are the cells that break down and build your bone. So you really want to make sure that um, you address all of those issues. So then let's talk about it. Um, you know, risk factors. Um, some things we just can't control, you know, genetics or genetics, but there are other things that we can look at and decide, you know, what we need to do. Um, you know, it can be your age, it can be your body weight, it can be a previous fracture, um, or you might have a family history of osteoporosis or fractures. Medications you're taking, um, excessive alcohol intake, and just as a reminder, that's one drink for women and two drinks for men is uh, a normal intake. Anything above that is um, deemed excessive. So, you know, the there are a lot of different things and there are other things that we're gonna talk about and that's also um, secondary osteoporosis. So a number of diseases and conditions um, may cause what is called secondary osteoporosis. Um, some are actually related to the bone health, but others, for instance, celiac disease or liver disease actually affect the nutrient absorption. So that's more in your um, small intestines where you're having those issues. Um, additionally, some of the treatments for the diseases may also affect uh, nutrition absorption. So 
not just having the disease, but actually the treatment for it can um, give you some cause for concern. Hormonal conditions may also affect your bone health. Um, this is not an inclusive list um, of things that can lead to poor bone health, but this is just kind of giving you some things to think about. Um, if you have any of these conditions or any other chronic condition, you know, that's another reason why maybe you should put, jot that down on your notes to talk to your healthcare provider about. So medications and bone loss, um, long-term use of some medications can really contribute to um, bone loss. So for instance, anticonvulsants and steroids, and then we're not talking about like testosterone steroids, we're talking about um, corticosteroids and cortisols or just, you know, other type steroids. For instance, prednisone um, is a very common glucocorticoid, cannot speak today. But also you have some other medications such as diuretics um, that can also cause that secondary loss. So we're talking about things like um, a really common one is furosemide, which the name brand is Lasix. Um, but there are other different type diuretics like the thiazides that don't actually cause a problem. So that would be like your hydrochlorothiazides um, or diazide, which is a combination medication or um, zesteretic, which has the lisinopril and the hydrochlorothiazide. So Always think about all the, the components of your medications and talk with your healthcare provider and or your pharmacist. They are a wealth of knowledge themselves um, to find out what your individual needs might be. We won't go into specific details on all these different type medicines, but we will discuss some overview so that you'll have enough information to go and speak with your healthcare provider. Um, also, when you go to your healthcare provider, take all your supplements. Just because it's over the counter, it doesn't mean it's not important. So take all of those with you because you might be getting calcium maybe in your multivitamin and then you're taking a supplement also. Um, so th that's helpful and it helps them to determine what might be appropriate for you. So there are other reasons for screenings. Um, you, the osteoporosis in men is more likely to be overlooked, and we've kind of addressed that before. Um, the recommendations are always specific for men as they are for women, and there isn't even a consensus of how to really interpret the bone density test results for the men. But the gap has led to men not realizing they had a problem or that they had osteoporosis until they had an actual issue, a fracture or back pain or something like that. So that should be another reason for people to get tested. Um, men should also discuss their need for testing. Um, I used to perform bone density studies and I can promise you for every 50 women I did, I probably only did one to two men. So it, it was not very, prevalent at that particular time, and that was a lot of years ago. Um, be proactive. Um, every year, you should go in and have your annual exam, and they're going to ask you at your physical. They'll say, what's your height? And you say, I don't know. I want to be measured. Take your shoes off and get measured. We all lose height with age, and losing that height can be part of a good reason for you to go and get a bone density study. So please do that. You're paying for the service. So don't just offer a number, what you thought was on your driver's license, but uh, it could be very different. So get them to measure you. Um, the only way to find out if you truly have osteoporosis is through a bone density study. Uh, these bone density scans are really safe. Uh, normal x-rays don't measure the actual density of the bone. So the scan measures the amount of minerals within that bone. If a bone demonstrates osteoporosis on an x-ray, 
then it's too late, the disease is present. So several types of tests are available and all of them are painless, they're non-invasive. It's very low radiation exposure. Um, not all, all bone density screening techniques provide the same information. So the most commonly used is the dual energy X-ray absorbatory, absorbatometry. Today is not the talking day for me. More commonly called the DEXA scan. And this test uses low levels of X-ray. It's absolutely painless and it's really non-invasive. Um, the bone density of the hip and the spine, and sometimes they will measure a wrist, and that's usually only if they've had an arm fracture recently. But those are the, the hip and the spine are the common areas that are tested. And it can vary at different sites. So you might have um, a lower density in your spine versus your hip or vice versa. The level of radiation um, is very minuscule. So uh, the particular unit I worked on, I was not required to wear a film badge. So I didn't have to have a level of radiation uh, reported when I would do those scans because it was so minuscule. That particular unit I used to have the scan done, they said it was like less than 15 minutes in the sun. So that's how much radiation you would have gotten. It's a very, very small amount. Screening or peripheral tests are used to determine if further testing is needed or if you need a central DEXA, if, if the central DEXA is not available. Um, these are often done more like at health fairs. So you might put your heel in um, and they would do that particular type test. Some medical offices do actually have those. And then if you get something abnormal, they would refer you on for a full DEXA scan. Um, if you have a peripheral test and it suggests that you might have some um, uh, effect on your bone density, absolutely take that information and go to your provider and they can um, get a DEXA scan or they can compare it to results of a previous one you might've already had. Um, there are some other tests that your doctors can do. Um, so for instance, you can get blood calcium levels. You can do a 24 hour urine um, and they'll measure the calcium in that. Thyroid function, parathyroid hormone levels. Uh, men, they will check testosterone levels. And it's become a lot more common and I like to see this, but they will check vitamin D levels also. Um, and that, it's really important because if you stop and you think about it, uh, if you have the decreased vitamin D level, then, you know, you may not be absorbing some of your calcium as well. Because think about it, they supplement your milk products with vitamin D. So too much of a parathyroid hormone um, can also cause bone loss. But um, giving parathyroid hormone as a drug, the Forteo, Builds bone. It's a little bit confusing, isn't it? But that's why it's always individualized and you should be speaking to your doctors. So, um, here we are. We're back at the DEXA scan again. Um, it is the gold standard of the bone density test and it's most widely recognized. Although bone density can be measured at any spot, because with this particular unit, you could actually scan the entire body. And you could, from top of the skull to the tips of the toes, you could scan the whole body. Um, usually, they will only do the lower back, the lumbar spine, and the hip. They'll look at the femoral neck just a little bit, but not too terribly far down it unless there is a reason. The scan determines two different scores. They are called a Z, the last letter of the alphabet, a Z score and a T score. It uses low doses of x-ray, about a tenth of the radi radiation dose of a chest x-ray. So like I said, it's a very safe test. Bone densitometry uses DEXA, involves lying on a padded surface with a pillow under your head. 
For the hip scan, we would place that large block under your legs. And that really kind of uh, helps to do a couple of things, but it really helps to push your pelvis down a little bit more so you get a better positioning. Um, the lower spine is scanned also with the, the legs are elevated. So, excuse me. The hip scan is flat because you will actually turn your ankles in. The positioning for the block is for the spine. And it doesn't take more than 10 minutes maximum to perform this test. And there's no discomfort, there's no injections, there's no dyes, anything like that. So it's incredibly safe, non-invasive. So what a Z-score is, is a score that actually compares your bone mineral density to somebody, um, a typical person of your age and sex. So it'll look at what, how old you are, and what your sex is, and they will compare you with your peers, so to speak. But it's a little bit misleading since a lot of times the people of that demographic may also have that low bone mineral density because it is common among older adults. So they can be more useful when looking at the bone density of children and teens or premenopausal women and younger men. But a diagnosis of osteoporosis or low bone mass is based on your T-score. And your T-score, no matter your age or your race, compares you to that of a healthy 30-year-old adult. So that's what we use is the T-score. So a zero T-score is normal. You're, you're the same as that healthy 30-year-old. A T-score of a negative one to a negative 2.5 indicates osteopenia. So you've got a little bit of low bone mass there. And, you know, of course, this is treatable. So a T-score of a negative 2.5 and lower shows osteoporosis. So once you hit that negative 2.5 or beyond, then you definitely got osteoporosis. In general, every one standard deviation below zero shows a 10% decline in bone mineral density. So anything, oh, I gotta go back. There we go, sorry. Um, that one standard deviation from zero to negative one says, okay, you've lost about 10% of your bone mineral density. So you just kind of keep that in mind. According to the World, World Health Organization, severe osteoporosis is defined as a bone mineral density less than negative 2.5. Um, and there have been one or more osteoporotic fractures. So the T, a T-score of a negative one to a negative 2.5 just really does indicate that low bone mass, also called osteopenia. And if you are diagnosed with osteopenia, now is the time to really start taking steps to improve your bone mass. Um, studies show that more than half of the fractures in postmenopausal women occur to those with osteopenia rather than actual osteoporosis. Um, so this is a great time for a physician to start preventative treatments. Um, the Build Your Bones curriculum, obviously, um, promotes the idea that you're never too old or too young to improve your bone health. So if you have been diagnosed with osteoporinia, osteopenia or osteoporosis, there are steps you can take to prevent or slow further bone loss. Uh, physical activity and diet are modifiable, and those both are influential factors in your bone health. So medications and supplements can also be made available. And again, I would definitely consult my physician. So when do you start treatment? Um, healthcare providers don't always agree at what T-score. Um, 
Many doctors use a T-score that's negative 2.5 or less, but the T-score isn't the only consideration. Um, the diagnosis may be based on a hip fracture or a fracture of the vertebrae or other fractures with existing low bone mass. The diagnosis may also be based on what's called the FRAX score, F-R-A-X. The FRAX tool uses information from your bone density test and also compiles other risk factors for you know, breaking a hip or other major bones over a 10 year period. So this tool is something that healthcare providers use to help them make treatment decisions for people with low bone density or postmenopausal women and men over age 50. Um, recommendations will take into consideration your other risk factors, your family history, low body weight, um, glucocorticoids usage, and also alcohol intake. So the recommendations are here from the National Osteoporosis Foundation on when to start uh, pharmacological treatments. Um, if you have that hip or ver vertebral back fracture, absolutely. Um, T scores, and then also, are you postmenopausal or did you have a hysterectomy where they took the uterus and the ovaries, maybe at a young age, you may or may not be on hormone treatment. So these are all things that you can think about. But the postmenopausal women, and of course men age 50 and older with osteopenia, and then that 10 year hip probability. And again, that goes on the FRAX basis. Those are all different things that you can do. And we do have some resources that we can drop these links into your chat box too. So the FRAX tool was developed to really evaluate hip fractures. And it provides a 10 year probability of if you as a patient um, might experience a fracture and it's all on computer modeling. Um, certain DEXA scans, when you have them, actually, they will put a, a notation. If, if the person performing the test has all the information and they can insert in all the different criteria that it requests, it will print out the FRAC score. So they may ask you several questions if you go in for a DEXA scan and you'll think, why are they asking me all these different things? or the physician may provide that information up front, have the nurse pull it ahead of time. So, all right, Melanie, I'm gonna turn this over to you. Thank you, Marie. That was great information that a lot of us probably are very interested in. So now we're gonna, uh, oh, first of all, I'm Melanie Taylor and I am the FCS agent in Bay County, Florida. So um, thanks for joining us today. And what I'm gonna talk about today are different goals of therapy. And we're gonna talk about um, medications. So what are the goals of therapy for the types of things we've been talking about um, is to prevent fractures, to minimize your bone loss, to preserve your structural integrity of your skeleton, improve the quality of life, minimize adverse events and decrease morbidity and mortality. It is important to remember that osteoporosis can affect us negatively and can uh, affect our quality of life due to pain and fear of falling and fracturing. And these different therapies we're gonna discuss can improve that quality of life. Next slide. So we're gonna talk about some of the medications. We don't have time to discuss all the medications in detail, but depending on your test results and your fracture risk, your healthcare provider may prescribe a medication. These medications may slow or stop bone loss or help rebuild your bones. There are several factors that may influence what is prescribed. These include sex, age, whether you have undergone uh, or whether you have gone through menopause, the severity of bone loss, the fracture risk, and existing health problems that you may have. 
So not all medications are approved for men, and we'll talk about each one specifically, and all medications have potential side effects, so it's important to discuss these options with your doctor, um, just like with any other medication. Almost all of them can have possible side effects. Um, so let's look at the medications. Um, one of the therapeutic options is bisphosphonates. And a lot of these that you can see that the um, generic and the brand name is listed there. A lot of us have heard of Fosamax, Boniva, um, Actinel. A lot of these are in commercials that we see or pop up on our um, feeds as commercials. Um, these, the bisphosphonates are probably the most commonly used. We'll talk about those in just a minute separately. There's also hormone replacement therapy. There's selective estrogen receptor modulators. We're going to talk about each of these individually. Um, there's calcitone, there's Forteo, and there's Prolia that you can see here. So we're going to talk about each one of those on the next slide. But what type is right for you is important for you and your healthcare provider to um, discuss. Okay. So talking about bisphosphonates, um, oral bisphosphonates, the three most common are Fosamax, uh, Actinel, and Boniva. Um, they are also there have, excuse me, there has also been a concern in recent years of potential damage to the bone in the jaw with prolonged use of bisphosphonates. There have been several studies ongoing about how long you should take these medications. They can be very effective, so it's important to weigh those potential benefits with the likely side, with those less likely side effects. It's always a good idea to review your medications annually, annually with your healthcare provider, and in case with something like this phenomenon, this phosphonates, um, just talking to them about how long you have been on that medication, just to, to look at those possible side effects. Next slide. So for oral, oral bisphosphonate um, instructions, you wanna take it first thing in the morning. You need to take it on an empty stomach with a full glass of water. Then you need to avoid and remain upright, oh, excuse me, avoid food and remain upright for 30 to 60 minutes. And that's because this medication can cause irritation to your esophagus and your stomach. Um, and you wanna use caution if you have heartburn and stomach and esophageal ulcers. So that's something you'll need to discuss with your doctor. Also, these are not given to pregnant women or those with poor, poor kidney functions. So it's very important to take your biophosphonates correctly. And generally, they do not cause side effects if people follow these instructions. Next slide. Then there are injectable bisphosphonates. Um, you've probably heard of these, Boniva and Reclast. Um, the oral forms may not be the best form for some people. So um, if you do have acid reflux, Barrett's esophagus, stomach ulcers, and difficulty with swallowing, you may wanna discuss these injectable or intravenous options that are available. Um, administration, administration of these are usually done in a doctor's office. Um, and you can see that they don't, they don't take very long the Boniva is only 15 to 30 seconds every three months through an IV injection. And uh, the Reclast is an IV infusion over 15 minutes once every year. Um, and you can pre-treat with acetaminophen, which is Tylenol, to reduce the risk of acute reactions. Next slide. Hormone therapy. We've heard a lot about that in the last few years in the media. Um, it does help reduce bone loss. It can increase bone density in the hip and spine, but there are some related health risks. Um, there could be an increase of breast and uterine cancer and possibility of stroke and heart attack. And those have been the most that we've heard about um, in the media. So during our childbearing years, a woman's body produces the hormone estrogen. At menopause, that production drops. The drop in this estrogen may contribute to bone loss. So you can actually have hormone replacement therapies, which has estrogen and progestin in it, or an ERT, which is an estrogen replacement therapy, which is estrogen only. And this can combat that bone, that, um, excuse me, can combat that bone loss. So recommendations for the hormone replacement therapy are now lower doses for a shorter period of time as possible to avoid some of those possible increased health risks. Next slide. Then we have selective estrogen receptor modulators, um, which a lot of people call abbreviate as SERMs. Um, these mimic some of the estrogen's positive side effects, or excuse me, positive effects without some of the problems with hormone replacement therapies. It has been approved by the FDA. The brand name is called Avista. Um, 
It is treatment for postmenopausal women. It reduces risk of vertebral, vertebral fractures. It's usually a 60 milligram tablet. And there can be an increased risk of thrombosis, hot flashes, and leg cramps. So just to know, I mean, we're giving you the um, possible side effects of each of these. So those are the ones for that. Um, if just in case you were considering going on that. And again, you need to discuss that with your doctor because you may be at lower risk for some of these things. All right, next slide. So then we have calcitonin. Um, this is FDA approved for the treatment of osteoporosis in women at least five years postmenopausal that failed other alternative therapies. Uh, it is not, it is approved only for treatment of osteoporosis, is not a prevention of osteoporosis. It slows bone loss and has been shown to reduce risk of spinal fracture, fractures. And it can be injected or administered through a nasal spray. So that's kind of a unique one here. The side effects are reduced in the nasal spray versus the injection. And you can see with the, um, the injection, it's daily or every other day. Uh, and then the side effects, it could cause allergic reactions to salmon. It can cause increased risk of malignancies. And then the intranasal could cause an, a runny nose. Next slide. So then we have what's brand name known as Forteo. It is derivative, it's a derivative of the parathyroid hormone, which is the hormone that, that releases to control the calcium levels in our blood. It's an anabolic, which means bone building agent for the treatment of postmenopausal osteoporosis and men at high risk of bone fracture. And as you can see, that's one of the first one we've mentioned men in. It's a daily injection, not to exceed 18 to 24 months of duration. So it is, um, uh, excuse me, I guess I lost my place. <laughs> um, it's not for patients with osteosarcoma, bone metastasis, um, hypercalcemia, or skeletal malignancy. Uh, so just knowing that, that if you have any of those or you know someone with those, this would not be a possible drug for them. Some of the side effects include leg cramps, nausea, and dizziness. Um, and there could be rapid bone loss after discontinuation. But again, that is something that needs to be discussed with your doctor, depending on the situation. Next slide. One of the most common ones a lot of us have probably seen ad for is Prolia. Um, it is approved for the treatment of osteoporosis in men and women. It isn't approved for prevention, and it is generally taken every six months through an injection. Uh, you can see that it is injected by your health professional. There can be some side effects, um, hypocalcemia, which is too little calcium in your blood. There can be an increased risk of cellulitis and skin rash and rarely a typical femur fractures. And there could also be rapid bone loss may occur after discontinuation of this medication too. Next slide. Some non-pharmacological treatments that um, we wanna talk about. Although medical interventions may be re recommended for low bone mineral density, lifestyle modification, modifications that we'll, we will discuss throughout the series can also help your bone protect your bones. These include fall prevention, proper nutrition, supplements if needed, just like we discussed last week, we discussed proper nutrition and supplements, um, multi-component exercise program, which we'll see in the future, uh, smoking cessation, making sure we try to quit if possible, um, alcohol moderation, and decreasing our, ca our caffeine consumption. All of those things are things we can help control um, through our own behaviors. Next slide. Just some steps to strengthen your bones. Some of these we've already discussed, adequate intake of calcium and vitamin D, taking other vitamins and minerals as needed, making sure we're doing some weight bearing exercises, avoiding risky behaviors and falls, limiting our alcohol intake, and then hopefully quitting smoking or um, e-cigarettes as, as uh, Marie discussed earlier. So you always wanna to talk to your healthcare provider about your risk as well as medications and supplements. And like Marie mentioned, always take your supplements with you. Make sure they know what you're taking because they can interact, interact with some of your medications. Uh, remember that building stronger bones doesn't happen overnight. So during the rest of this class, we're gonna help provide you some tools to help build your bones. Um, 
and feel good about your calcium and vitamin D intake and the health of your bones. Uh, next slide. So in summary, um, we have discussed your risk of, factor, of fracture with your health provider. Always do that. Make sure you discuss that with them. Um, get your bone density screening if recommended. Uh, discuss treatment options with your healthcare provider and adhere to your medication instructions and any necessary follow-up lab or bone density studies. Remember, um, some of those medications wanted you to take them in a specific way and we need to make sure we follow those directions to get the best use of that medication and the best benefits. Next slide. So um, looking at your, uh, your bone building steps for this week, we've got our, um, uh, we've talked about the medications and supplements that can affect your bones and the importance of bone density testing for individuals. So how will you apply what you've learned today towards your overall bone health? So here is your sheet for the week. And I'm assuming, Wendy, that this was emailed to them yesterday as it has been in the past few weeks. You can make some goals and hopefully um, see some improvement with those goals over the, over the course of this uh, class. And then it, after the class, hopefully you'll continue that. So you should have that in your email. Um, it was a good way to write down your goals and to prepare yourself for a few changes you might want to make um, to improve your bone health. Next slide is, do you have any questions? Um, I know that there have been some chat questions coming up, so I'm 